Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, I do want to speak about the five things that we have learned from this match between Barcelona and Hetafe. I was looking at this game for a second time and I did get one conclusion. In my honest, biased Barcelona, Kule opinion, I still think that Barcelona is the best team in the world. And that's if they want to be. Because the way that Barcelona performed against Etafe, it was phenomenal in all sectors. You can call me delusional. You can call me stupid. You can call me ridiculous. It's okay. It's fine. I understand. I understand why you think another way. But for me, again, in my opinion, that's extremely biased. I believe that Barcelona is the best team in the world. But here's the problem. If the players don't feel that way, that will show off. That will show on the pitch easily. If you have any ounce of self-doubt, then for sure you will lose a lot of games. And that is one of the reasons on why Barcelona have been struggling so much this season is because they believe that they cannot really do it. But to me, right, when I saw this match, I'm like, these are players that are more than capable to perform at such a high level to be competitive. So let's go on to this conversation and let's talk about the first thing that we have learned from this match. And that is about Kubarsi. Kubarsi, playing as a right center back, is amazing. And it does lead to Araujo also covering the left center back position moving forward. I think that having Araujo on the left side with Kubarsi on the right side makes much more sense, mainly because Araujo can cover for Cancelo when Cancelo Cancelo does go up and Araujo is always going to be there in case Cancelo loses the ball. I would much rather have Araujo take on that side and that responsibility over Kobarsi in case again Cancelo does lose the ball. With Kobarsi going on the right side, it does give that great mixture between Kunde's defensive quality and Kobarsi's technical quality. Everything just seems much more balanced on that defensive line. As a matter of fact, not just that, not only does Kobarsi look so in place in that position, but he also does seem like one of the captains. At the age of just 17 years old, he He's really showcasing just how much self-confidence he does have. For example, according to Mundo Deportivo, they have stated that Rafinha was upset for the two missed chances at the end of the first half yesterday. And when the players were heading towards the dressing room, Paulo Barsi consoled him. It was a gesture of encouragement by the 17-year-old for someone who is just nine years older than him. And again, it shows us that Kubarsi is so mature for his age. The fact that he was able to tell Rafinha, hey, it's okay, maybe next time you can do better because you got this. It also shows us that Kubarsi himself has a lot of self-belief because usually when you are confident in yourself, you want to be able to spread that to other players. Kubarsi is one of those players and that's very exciting. So with the leadership that he shows, the defensive discipline that he also shows, he's also great on the ball. Xavi Hernandez stated this, Paul Kubarsi is the best ball playing defender we have. It's spectacular to watch him play and he's only 17 years old. And to say a sentence like that with a team that contains Kunde, Andreas Christensen, Inigo Martinez, three players who are very good with the ball. The fact that he rates Kubarsi higher than them, I'm like, dude, like I also I also believe you, Chavi. I also think that what you're speaking is facts. Kubarsi is becoming the player that we all thought Eric Garcia was going to be at this point. So at the moment, Kubarsi has everything in terms of defensive discipline, his leadership, and what he does on the ball. In this match, he had two out of two tackles won, four out of four aerial duels won, and two out of two ground duels won. He did not lose any duels or any tackles in this match against Hetafe, a Hetafe side that showed great aggressiveness in terms of pressuring our defensive line. Moving on towards point number two, and that is the league still being alive. At the moment that I am recording this video, Real Madrid and Sevilla are still playing, and I hope that Ramos is playing the game of his life. I hope that Ramos defends for his life and he becomes like the best center back in the world at this moment to, to make sure that Real Madrid do not score a single goal because I want to see Real Madrid lose points tonight because that is only going to make the league even much more alive. I was also looking at the games that Madrid could lose. There's about two or three matches that I believe Real Madrid could let go of some points alongside with Barcelona beating Real Madrid at the Santiago Bernabeu. It's, it's very much there. Mathematically, it is still possible for Barcelona to go into first place. It's just going to be extremely difficult. And I think that the, the only thing that we have to take care of is not look at the result of Real Madrid. I think that we just have to take care of ourselves. Focus on ourselves. Becoming the best version of Barcelona. And take one game at a time. Because if Barcelona can bring that exact same intensity that we saw against Hetafe to every other match, Barcelona can beat every team. As a matter of fact, I'll even say this. And I know that this is going to sound a little weird 
weird, but it, let me explain. I think that this is probably one of the best games that we have had under Xavi Hernandez's era. Like one of the best. I would put it like in the top two or top three. And I know that there are a lot of games where Barcelona outperformed themselves. Like we saw that 4-0 win against Real Madrid. There was also, I believe, a 4-2 win over Napoli or a 5-0 win against Antwerp. I know that there's a lot of matches, but I'm not talking about in terms of goals. I'm talking about in terms of how much these players wanted to win. Barcelona showed so much enthusiasm, so much aggressiveness against Etafe, and they showed that they really wanted to win. I never saw characteristics from these players in a very long time, and they brought that against Etafe. These players, they looked extremely hungry. Everything that they were doing in terms of like passing, attacking, defending, tracking back, running into space, all of that was extremely fast. They pressed, and they were just running everywhere. Like I saw Kubarsi make multiple passes to Frankie de Jong. Frankie de Jong takes a one-touch pass to Gulagan, and then they went on to attack. Everything was going by quick. Kunde was making like two or three like fast passes to Rafinha. Rafinha was running into space. Everything was very well spaced. Even with Joao Felix, Joao Felix was having the ball. He inverted in. Cancelo was making an overlapping run. He passes it to Cancelo. Cancelo passes it to Lewandowski. Everything was going at a fast pace. And I love that because when Barcelona is this, is this aggressive, this assertive in everything that they do, when they, when they show confidence in what they're doing, they become the best team in the world, if not one of the best teams in the world. And that is one of the reasons why I said that earlier in this video is because if Barcelona really want it and they really want to win in a game and they show aggressiveness, they become a really dominant team. Like if only this team played like this since the beginning, Barcelona would definitely be in first place at this point. It just sucks to even think about that because the amount of like points that we lost over some ridiculous games, I'm just like, dude, like if only we just won against Girona or Real Madrid or Villarreal. That was at home, by the way. It was at Barcelona's home. We could have gotten another nine extra points from those games and we would have been 60, 66 points on top of the table. But at the end of the day, we played well. Yes, even without a pivot, a real pivot in our team, even without a Gavi, even without a true left winger. And that is what's going to lead me towards point number three. If Barcelona can match the intensity of the opposition in every match, they become monsters. It's a very similar key point to the key point of number two. I want this Barcelona team to want more, to never ever get tired. Like if they see an opportunity to score three goals, they should go for five. And the only way that we can be efficient and score a lot of goals is by being efficient between the defense and the midfield. Because if we can get out of the press of any team, because that's what many teams and, and opponents like to do against us. If we can get out of, of the press, pass fast, get the ball to the midfield, retain the ball, have maximum concentration, that is what's going to allow us to set up well to go on to the attack. If we look at the heat map and also the pass network, you can see that Barcelona had a great passing network with a lot of emphasis being added between the defense and the midfield. A lot of emphasis on Araujo, Kubarsi, Kunde with Andreas Christensen and also Frankie. There's a lot of passes going on between them. And that's mainly again because every time Hetafe were trying to press us, we passed very well and we never lost the ball. There was never any misplaced passes. And so because of that, that is what led towards Gundogan eventually getting the ball in a high area and go on to the attack or Rafinha seeing that ball from either Frankie or Kunde to make those runs. And that is what's going to lead us towards point number four, which is Andreas Christensen taking Pedri out of the team. Now, let me explain. I do believe that for this season, at the very least, Andreas Christensen's emergence is going to push out Pedri from the starting 11, or at the very least, just put him in a different position because this double pivot that we are seeing between Christensen and Frankie, it's working very well. I don't want to touch that. I don't want anything to be moved by that. And the reason why it works well is because there's great balance between defensive qualities and creative qualities. It's a very similar balance to the one of Gubarsi and Araujo shifting positions. Like I like the fact that Araujo is on the left center back position and Gubarsi is on the right center back position because you have Araujo bringing that defensive balance to Cancelo. It's crazy to even think about this because what if the whole answer for Barcelona was all about balance and, pl and placing players in different positions on the pitch? What if it was just that? Because I just think that the only thing that, the only thing that Barcelona was missing to become stronger and a better version of themselves this season is to have a much better balanced team and to have Christensen and Frankie in the double pivot position especially brings a lot of defensive stability. And it allows for Frankie to drive up with the ball with a lot of safety because he knows he's going to be having Andreas Christensen 
behind him in case he does lose the ball, even though Frankie does not even lose the ball like 99% of the time. So as you can see in these pictures, you can see that Christensen is the deepest midfielder usually with Frankie as the second deepest midfielder and then Gundogan acting as the highest number eight and the highest midfielder. Sometimes there is scenarios where Frankie becomes the deepest midfielder and Christensen pushes up. This usually only happens when Ter Stegen has the ball because he knows that a player that he can't count on, it is Frankie. He is one of the outlets to get out of the pressure. And one player remains in the same position and that is Gundogan. Gundogan usually never goes that deep and he always acts as a number eight, as you can see, right? That this leaves no room for Pedri because where is Pedri going to function in a midfield like this? This is a great balance. You have Christensen, Frankie, and then Gundogan as the eight. There is no room for Pedri. Pedri can play as a left winger, but you know, there are moments in Barcelona's matches where you need to have a, a real goal scorer on the left wing position. Players like Ferran Torres, Vitor Roque, Joao Felix can bring those goal scoring abilities. I know that Pedri does great when it comes to like retaining the ball, acting as a fourth midfielder, but dude, we need a great left winger that can score goals and stretch the pitch. Now we can also say, okay, well, what about Pedri just going into Gundogan's position and they can be exchanging positions and they can both just be in and out, right? Pedri goes on the bench, Gundogan goes on the pitch. Gundogan goes on the bench or Pedri goes on the pitch, which again, it does make sense. But to be honest, like really listen to me here and I really want you guys' opinion. Don't you guys feel like it would be a much better idea to have Fermin Lopez on the pitch over Pedri at this time, at this point? of the season. It, like if we really assess both of their forms, Fermin Lopez seems like the most ideal player to place on the pitch over Pedri and to go on for Gundogan if Gundogan ever does need rest. And we have Fermin Lopez as the highest midfielder with Frankie and Christensen behind Fermin Lopez. Because right now, Fermin Lopez really, in a way, resembles Gavi in terms of like the intensity, the runs, the interceptions, and the aggressiveness he brings in the middle of the pitch. Pedri brings none of that. And the, the type of team that Barcelona is right now, we need a midfielder that can bring a lot of aggressiveness and intensity. Pedri barely runs. And I, and I would much rather have a midfielder that's a 8 out of 10 in defending and also a 8 out of 10 in creativity over a player that's a 4 out of 10 in defending and a 9.5 out of 10 in creativity. You understand what I'm saying? Like I would much rather have a midfielder that is average or at least solid in defending and creative instead of somebody who is weak in defending but very good in creative. But this all started with Christensen's emergence because you could just you just cannot take away Frankie and Andreas Christensen right now. Like goodbye to Oriol Romeo too. Like he's never going to be seeing the pitch ever again. And that only leaves one position open in the middle and that is Gundogan. And Gundogan is also a player, right? We have even begun talking about Gundogan himself. Gundogan is a player that actually brings numbers, actual assists, actual goals. And so this is not going to be like a segment where I'm trashing on Pedri. I just think that right now the competition is even greater, much greater, much stronger. And it's only going to get worse from here once Xavi Hernandez does sign a real pivot, someone like Zubimendi. And that is what's going to lead us towards the last key point, which will be key point number five. And that is Xavi's project has the potential to be so great but it is unfortunately going to be cut off short. Now, part of me still kind of hopes that Xavi Hernandez stays at Barcelona after this season. Like I still have that little ounce of hope. I do want that, I'm not gonna lie. Because let's just say for example, like I, I picture this every day, like all the time, to be honest, I'm, I'm just gonna put it out here. But I picture this every day and I imagine this, that this is what's probably going to happen at the end of the season. Barcelona win La Liga, we go into the semifinals of the Champions League, we, we just get knocked out, which is okay, because as long as we compete in the semifinals of the Champions League, that is a good sign. And I think that if, you know, if Barcelona can do those two things at the end of the season, Xavi Hernandez changes his, his decision, he gets persuaded by the players and he stays. That is what I kind of hope does happen. Because I look at this team, I look at the players, I look at what they could do if they choose to. Because that is the one thing that annoys me is that sometimes they choose not to compete. But if they choose to, they have so much capability to do great things. So much capability. Like, I, again, like I, I was looking at this game for a second time and I'm like, you know, all we have to do is do this every match, be self-accountable, rotate well, have the players have self-belief and Barcelona will be fine. And the only thing that we're missing right now is two players, a signing of a true central defensive midfielder and a signing of a true left winger, like a world-class left winger. No disrespect to Joao Felix, no disrespect to Ferran Torres. I know that they do try extremely hard to get as many goals as possible 
and to do their job. But at the end of the day, Barcelona do need a world-class athletic, something that Felix and Fernand are not, athletic goal-scoring winger. They need somebody like that. And the only player that I can think of is Rafael Liao. I have been calling out Liao's name since like the beginning of this season. I'm like, Barcelona need Liao. They need a fast-paced left winger that can stretch the pitch, that is comfortable going out wide, hugging the touchline, scoring goals, and doing goals by themselves. Barcelona need that. And we also do need a disciplined, positional, intelligent, central defensive midfielder. And the only player that I can think of, it is Zubi Mendy. And so I think that if you add the, these two players, Zubi Mendy and Liao, to this Barcelona squad, they that is one hell of a project. And so I, I, I just want Xavi Hernandez to have that chance to fully flesh out his image, his version of Barcelona. He has not been able to do this. And because of this financial problem that Barcelona have been going through, th- this problem that Xavi is going through and the fact that he can't sign certain players, it's not normal. Like to have a 17-year-old center back in our defensive line and starting and, and being one of our best center backs is not normal. Having Lamine Yamal lead our attack at just 16 years old and playing in every match is not normal. Grabbing a center back and placing him into the center defensive midfield position to play with Frankie, it is not normal. Like where else do you see problems like this arise in the world of football besides Barcelona? That is because Barcelona lack a lot of resources and Xavi Hernandez has to get the best out of the trouble that he's in and he's doing a great job and I'm like dude like don't even think about like the fact that you think that that you're a failure like you're not like just go for another season don't let the media persuade you and the fact that Xavi Hernandez has even like admitted that the media does say certain things and he hears it out because he goes onto the internet and he listens to the opinions of other people like the fact that I know this now dude Xavi if you're listening to this right now if if you are watching this right now and you're watching my videos but you just don't say nothing if you're listening to this right now or if there's any Barcelona player that also do listen to it because if you're gonna have a coach listen to the opinions of the media what makes you think that the players are not going to also listen to the opinions of the media who are younger who are much more on TikTok and Instagram and and YouTube and all of these things like dude if if Barcelona is hearing me right now the, the players La Minia Mal, Fermin Lopez, Pedri, Gavi, Xavi, Xavi bro like don't quit we support you fully everything that you have been hearing comes from people who want to see Barcelona destroyed and the only way they can destroy Barcelona is by having you Xavi out of the picture because I think that you're doing a great job you're doing amazing I want you to 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 continue to get the best version out of Barcelona because only you can there is no other coach and trust me there are other coaches out there that had to leave only because they thought that that was the correct move when they did not even allow for that coach to fully flesh out the project like for example two or three days ago Nagelsmann said this I was appointed at Bayern with the aim of changing things there are clubs that give you the time Jurgen Klopp was at Liverpool for five years until he became champions there for the first time Guardiola only won the Champions League title with Man City after seven years the coaches at Bayern Munich don't give you that much time to develop anything and so again like we have already seen a recent case like this and what could happen right after look at what Bayern Munich were building with Nagelsmann at that time they were doing something special it was not great yet but it was heading towards the right direction. But then Bayern thought that it was the correct decision to let go of Nagelsmann, go for a more experienced coach, bring him in. But now look at where Bayern Munich is at with Tuchel. Now Bayern are going to be sacking Tuchel. Now Bayern are just left with nothing and they're not competing for anything. And that is what gets me nervous about Barcelona letting go of Xavi Hernandez. And Xavi Hernandez also saying like, yes, this is the correct move. I think that this is the best for all parties. And for Barcelona to believe that makes me nervous because what if it happens to Barcelona again? They think that this is the correct move. They go on to get a experienced coach, whatever the hell that means. And Barcelona ends up in the same position of Bayern Munich. Xavi has only completed two full seasons. After this season is over, he's going to have two full seasons that he has, that he has completed. That is nothing. Why not give Xavi a third full season? Why not? Why not give him one more transfer window where Barcelona go all out and get the two players that Barcelona do need? Because it just makes no sense to start over. And so I'm just going to end the video here. I know I know that I probably went way past like 15 minutes. This video is probably going to be like 20 minutes long or something like that. But it is what it is. This is going to be my discussion for today. I hope you guys did enjoy this one. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one.